full-time MSBA, the MSBA online, and also uh, run the Center for Analytics Impact. And I teach in the program as well. I teach prescriptive analytics. Uh, so my area is optimization. In fact, I'm teaching uh, this term. So maybe I'll turn it to Jennifer. Great, thanks. Uh, so my name is Jennifer Claggett. Um, I'm an assistant professor at Wake Forest. Um, and, and I have my hands in both research and teaching. Um, this will be my third year teaching in the um, MSBA program. Uh, and I uh, will be teaching data management. Um, I'm an IS professor and I have some experience as a database administrator, so I love this topic. Uh, love making sure students have a strong foundation in data. Um, and I have also taught the analytics and society course. I'm passing the torch on that one, but I'm happy to talk about it if that's of interest. Good evening, my name is Shannon McKean. And if you do come to Wake Forest, uh, you can't call me Dr. McKean because I don't have a PhD. My background is in industry, but I've been part of the program for since its, um, its origins. I teach the practicum, which is a three course um, program that starts in October, runs through May. And there's some classroom content around problem framing, project management, teamwork. But the core of it is you will be um, partnered with between three or four of your classmates and you'll have an external client with expectations. You'll help them solve a business challenge with a data orientation. And I look forward to answering your questions about the practicum projects. Perfect, thank you. Um, so we have a couple of questions that we'll kind of move through uh, throughout the session, but uh, your guys' questions are first and foremost. So if you have something that you would like addressed by our faculty, if you could just uh, just drop it right in the chat and we'll address that. Um, or even we have a small group too, you can feel free to take yourself off mute and we can have a conversation. Um, but with that, we can kind of kick it off. Uh, one of the main questions that we get uh, is about the curriculum. So we'll start talking ab about that there. I'm curious if you guys could maybe address some of the key elements of the curriculum in the MSBA program, specifically the connection to the marketplace uh, and our advisory board. So I'll take that question. I think uh, uh, Jeff usually answers that question, but I think there's a strong connection to the marketplace. I think uh, Jeff can talk more about the board of advisors, which are industry experts. Um, Jeff uh, hosted a terrific conference uh, 10 days ago where there was a panelist of, of board members and they're all chief analytics officers or the equivalent for their organizations in a variety of industries. So they had great advice and they were great keynotes. Where I think the strongest connection to uh, industry is to the practicum. You know, the, the beauty of these projects are they are real world. And as much as we try to present to you real world situations in the classroom, there's nothing like sitting across the table from a client who's frustrated or doesn't know what they really want or doesn't understand analytics and working with them to frame the problem and deliver value and impact for that. So I think there's a direct connection, but maybe Jeff or Jennifer want to wow. add to that. There's 12 people. Are you kidding me? I can I can speak to the uh, to the board of advisors and to some extent other parts of the curriculum. So yeah, we have an advisory board. It has about now it's up to about 25 people. Um, it's some Fortune 500 companies: Exxon Mobil, Procter and Gamble, uh, all the big banks, the big consulting companies, uh, Deloitte, PwC, and others like that but also uh, some smaller local companies like uh, True Lion Credit Union, Inmar Intelligence. Uh, so they're, it's a mixture of national companies and some local companies, but they are really uh, a great group. They, we just had our meeting, uh, I guess it was last week actually, uh, virtual because of uh, Corona, but normally they come to campus. One of the favorite, their favorite things to do is meet with our students. So we always build in time for our advisory board members to meet with our students and uh, typically it's you know talking about how can you best prepare for the market in terms of a job search what are the career tracks inside their company uh, but they the advisory board members have also been instrumental in hiring our students so for example last last year when things were pretty tense when the virus was breaking out in spring things got a little a little crazy uh, Procter & Gamble hired four of our students, just reached out, you know, the advisory board member reached out, found some matches, helped shepherd them through the, their programs at P&G. 
Uh, so and their whole job as an advisory board is to make sure that our curriculum is matching the needs of the marketplace. So we meet with them twice a year, but they love meeting with students. They link in with you. They help you know help you any way they can. So then the other thing I'll say is most of our most of our coursework, even outside the practicum, typically will have some kind of project. So I think uh, I'll turn it to Jennifer. I mean, she can you know one of the one of the things that really gets you in the door uh, is you you almost it, it, you have to know how to manage data, and that's what Jennifer teaches. So I'll give it to her. Yeah, no, that was that was. Uh, all great information, and um, since I since I have uh, I can't take any credit for the overall curriculum design. I'll point to, to Jeff and Shannon on, on doing a great job, and they just sort of gave you the reasons that it's sort of always sort of evolving, and there's touch points, and to make sure that everybody's prepared for the marketplace. But I will just say, from sort of um, somebody with a little bit of, of more outsider perspective, I have a lot of respect for the curriculum and how all the pieces. You don't have any wasted courses here. Like every piece I think is really um, foundational for making sure that you're um, uh, well positioned for the job market. And I think you know the, the, the handoff Jeff just gave is a perfect example. I've taught in other um, very great analytics programs before, but they don't do as good of a job putting data management early on so that you appreciate it. You know, these nice little textbook data sets don't really grow out on trees. You actually need to know how to wrangle the data and to respect how to put it together, to clean it, um, to manage it, to have to be a, a person at the table making those types of data decisions. Even if your job isn't being the database man manager, it's, it's to use the data in, in some form of analytics. It's not like that that is completely siloed. Um, so that's an, an example. And the other place I would put an example is our um, analytics and society class, where we take a step back and we're preparing you to be leaders not just people who can only do a tunnel vision modeling sort of scenario. And to that end, the um, analytics and society class is designed to recognize, hey, we are really changing a lot of things with our use of analytics on so many fronts. And what are the real impacts to us as employees, our customers, and even broader? You know, how are we changing society? How are we making sure to take care of everybody fairly? And those types of things. And I think those are perfect examples of what makes the Wake Forest program unique. Um, and then, of course, folds into why our students are competitive in the job market. Wonderful, thank you. Um, Jeff, you, I might hand you the next question. If you could talk a little bit about the evolution of the curriculum from its inception to uh, now, that would be wonderful. Sure, yeah, we, I guess we're in cohort five. I lose track now. Uh, so, there have been changes even in that short amount of time. So we are constantly looking at the curriculum. In the first edition in, in MSVA Wake Forest version 1.0, um, we were teaching in the summer uh, probability and stat methods, which is still there, uh, and two separate courses in R and SAS. And then SAS and R kind of permeated the program. We also had two separate programs uh, around data visualization and communicating. So we used to have uh, visual analytics or data visualization, I guess it was. And then of course, I really like the title of this course that no longer exists because I made the title up, but it used to be called Analytics in the Boardroom. Uh, and I, I mentioned those four courses because we've, we've actually made changes there uh, pretty quickly out of the gate. So we took the, just recently actually, just took the uh, SAS and R and combined them. And because we had feedback from our corporate partners that our students should go deeper in R. So maybe focus on one piece of software instead of spreading it out. And we still have, you know, opportunity to learn SAS uh, outside of the curriculum. Some students get SAS certified, but we focus now more on R. And then we had those two courses Visual analytics, uh, it was, was data visualization and then analytics in the boardroom. And we, we came to realize, those are two half-term courses, we came to realize those topics are so intertwined. How you influence and uh, you know, drive impact is related to how you display results and, and how you display data. And so we combined those two for, I think, a richer experience. It's probably one of the most unique courses we have. So now, it's called visual analytics and influencing. And um, I've done that. It is another uniqueness, I think, of our program 
that we put so much emphasis on that to where visualization and communication is a full semester course. Uh, but I did some research. Uh, we have a publication so with some other faculty. We, we uh, did text mining on six, over 600,000 job ads. And then we put terms in buckets and looked at what percentage of those job ads had a term from a given bucket. Two thirds, roughly, almost two thirds of the job ads mentioned communication and interpersonal skills. These are data science and analytics jobs. And so clearly there's a gap if the if industry's mentioning that. And I think we do an excellent job of not only giving you the technical skills, but emphasizing communication and teamwork. Uh, the other change that we made that I think was very significant that came directly out of our advisory board is um, we put, we, we have always had a class called predictive analytics and data mining, which had some machine learning in it. And they said, maybe you need a separate course on machine learning, separate those two topics. Uh, and so we did that. Um, we, we dropped a, another, we used to have a course in HR analytics, which we dropped because almost none of our students were going in, into that area, but we substituted mach a machine learning half-term course. So we've made uh, a lot of changes and we're having discussions now. I mean, we're, we, won't, we won't change the curriculum on you at this point for next year, but um, I've had some discussion with faculty around, for example, right now there's a marketing analytics course and it's followed up, it's a half term, and it's followed up with a digital marketing analytics course. And there's a question of, should those be combined into a single semester long course? Is there some benefit to doing that? So we're studying those things. Um, and, you know, as, as Jennifer mentioned, the uh, analytics and society course is also, I think, part of the curriculum that differentiates us. So we, you know, we have not, um, we really haven't changed that at all because I think we were, we were pretty unique. I'm seeing more and more programs like Notre Dame and others are adding courses like that. Uh, but when we first started, it was unusual to dedicate a full half term to ethics and data privacy and what are the implications for society and the kind of things we're doing. And you're seeing the, the liberal arts influence of Wake Forest in our program that way. I hope I didn't miss anything. Chime in, Jennifer and Shannon, if I forgot a change we made, but um, we're always, the, the, the point is we're always looking at the curriculum, yeah, keeping it current. And someone will ask me why we're teaching R and not Python. So maybe I'll go ahead and address that. <laughs> uh, and so um, it, there's always this R versus Python thing. Python is a more general purpose language and R is more specific, I would say to analytics. And so um, my view is, and, and the truth is when you learn one, you can learn the other. So. Some people would argue R is more difficult to learn, but um, I, I just view R as more relevant for analytics and Python is maybe more of a data science uh, kind of application where you might be actually charged with deploying something inside, you know, some other larger enterprise system or something like that. So first and foremost, what we're, we're trying to create is problem solvers. So with that, I'll stop. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad you bring up, um, you know, the languages that we're using in the program. One of the biggest questions that we get is students asking about the level of familiarity that's expected uh, coming into the program with uh, with R. Um, and so I'm curious if you guys could talk on that expectation a little bit. Well, no, I can... Go ahead, Jennifer. Well, I was going to say, I, you know, I, I surveyed my data management students this fall um, with, you know, just sort of general, what is your background like? What concerns do you have? You know, one of these, one of these getting to know you type surveys. Um, and so I will say that there was a little bit of a spectrum. Some, some of them had had um, some database before. Some of them had had some more, um, you know, they came from maybe engineering backgrounds or computer um, science backgrounds, or there was a handful of those. But I would say the, the vast majority of them um, the, the first really sort of technical language they had learned was that summer, I, I, I get them in fall. And so they had had a little bit over our summer courses, um, which Jeff actually just mentioned some of, but so there was a little bit of apprehension on, you know, am I supposed to already come with the skills? 
And I, and I don't want to put words in, in people's mouths, but I think the answer is no, we're going to teach you the skills. You know, you need to come with ready to work. You need to come with sort of um, ready to, especially if it's all new to you, you're going to, you, you need to learn them and you're going to have to put in the hours there to learn that. Um, but the students at the end of the semester, you know, I surveyed them again and they, the ones that were very afraid of it and did not know any bit about SQL or any of those type things felt like they had really been put through their paces and they knew it, but it, that there was no need to have advanced knowledge of, of that um, from my point of view. And they learned a lot. And I think that they were pleased with themselves. I was pleased with them, um, e even the ones that were the most worried about it. I'll just echo that. I think languages change, tools change. I think once you've learned one, it's easier to learn another. Uh, and so I think, you know, it, it, it it's the process of learning how to use a computer language and with this R or Python, it, it, to me, it's indifferent because who knows what your employer will use and you can't predict at the beginning of your program what your employer will use. And oftentimes you'll have to learn a new tool or technique the first week on the job or in the practicum. So it's, um, I, there's not, a, I, in my experience from talking to students, there's not a prerequisite. Yeah, and I'll, I'll add that, um, so we have a lot of variance uh, as Jennifer said, we have a lot of variance in backgrounds. And here's what I've seen over the last five years. So we'll have uh, business students, students who maybe came out of accounting or marketing, uh, finance, and they are challenged sometimes by the technical courses. But they'll take, we don't waive anybody from anything. Okay, so, but, so they'll also take our business metrics course <laughs> which is easy for them. And maybe some of the marketing and finance and ops supply chain that comes in the spring term is easier for some of the business students. Um, and for the, for the math majors and the econ majors and the computer science majors, the technical courses are a little easier, but they hit their first case in business metrics and they're like, what's a case, you know? And so they struggle a little bit more with the business side. And so it's sort of like, you know, everybody, there's a set of courses that are going to be easy for some students. There's a set of courses that will be more of a challenge. And it kind of flips a little bit based on your background. I'm like one's a complement of another. Um, the, the exceptions would be, and we've had just maybe a few of these. You know, if somebody comes in like a math stat major with a business minor, then, you know, they're still learning a lot, but they are, they, they don't have that you know, either or kind of background. Uh, but I'll tell you, after, after our second year of our program, I went to our advisory board and I said, look, here's what I'm seeing. Uh, these students struggle with these classes. These other students struggle with these classes. Should we just bring in all business students or just bring in all math majors? And the advisory board said, absolutely not. You want that mix of strengths. And that's what they're going to face when they get out there. So... Uh, we've stuck true to that. We think that diversity of backgrounds is a major plus for our students. Uh, and when we put you in teams for Shannon's class, we make sure that there's a mixture of all different types. So we have a, uh, I'm, I'm proud to say, an optimization model. Surprise! That I've I built, big surprise, that we use to assign students to teams. So you'll be in a diverse team and we measure diversity in a lot of, on a lot of dimensions. So academic background, we will ask you about your coding background, ethnicity, gender, international versus not international, international who went to undergraduate school in the US, those that did not, we factor all that in. Um, and I can't remember if we did it this year, even in, if you're familiar with strength finders, we even, we built that into the model. Maybe that was year before last, but um, at any rate, Diversity is, strength, is a strength on every dimension is how we feel about it. And so we will, if you're, if you're squirmish about coding, we do have a coding boot camp. I don't know if that's on your list of things to talk about, Susie, but we will be offering a boot, uh, a boot camp in coding. If you've never coded before at all, you might consider it, but it's optional. We start, we don't assume anything when we start in July. So we start from first principles on the coding side. Uh, but like I said before, we never, we don't waive any, anything. So the first two courses in the program, you'll also take a career management in summer, uh, career management, one credit hour course, but probability and statistical models and the 
the um, coding course. You can come in with a master's degree in statistics. We usually don't see that, but we have seen students with a bachelor's degree in math, a bachelor's degree in statistics, and you still sit through our basic stats course. And you know what? They still learn something because they haven't seen some of the applications into business. And we actually have uh, historically hired some of those students to serve as tutors in the class they're taking. So that seems a little odd. And I, actually, as the associate dean, when someone first mentioned that to me, I thought that doesn't seem, is that going to work? It actually works really well. Uh, so anyway, um, diversity is a strength. And so we have a lot of people with different backgrounds and uh, they bring uh, different weaknesses and strengths. We all have different weaknesses and strengths. Um, back to you, Susan. Perfect. Thank you. Um, you already covered one of my next questions talking about teams, so we're ahead. Um, I did want to talk a little bit about thinking about the practicum project and our, our curriculum. Uh, if you guys could talk a little bit about the collaboration among faculty and how courses uh, kind of complement each other throughout the program, that would be wonderful. Yeah, I, I'll take that initially because you mentioned the practicum. Thank you, Susie. Uh, so, you know, there's biweekly faculty meetings where we talk about what's going on, what's being covered to make sure there's collaboration. Where I most benefit from the collaboration of my peers, and we had one today. So one of the things that you'll do in your practicum is, is getting to the end of the project. Most of the teams have a final presentation with their client, you know, next week or the week after. And so we have what we call a red team review, and we put the team in front of some staff and faculty to give a dry run of the presentation. And like I said today, it's meant to be tough love. We don't spend time talking about how good you did. We focus on how you can improve the story, the analytics, and the impact that your project's gonna make for your client. And Jennifer was kind enough to, to be there today and gave some real tough love to some of those teams on the uh, stuff. And so that's a, you know, that's a way we collaborate and understand what's going on in each other's classes. Can I pause for a random question? Is that a Georgia shirt that Ryan Wilson is wearing? It, yes, it is. I, I graduated from Georgia. Georgia. He's in, let him in, right. You got a Georgia fan, all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you get your degree there? Your undergrad yeah, there? I, I just graduated uh, back in December with a degree in economics from the business school. Fabulous, so my PhD is from Cary. Okay, that's awesome. All right, sorry, you can, you can have the mic back now, Susie. I just, I just had to interject. No, that's wonderful, that's wonderful. Uh, and another question we get a lot um, during consults and during these panels is how accessible are our faculty uh, in general? How can I reach them? Um, if you guys can talk about those, those relationships that you build with your students and how accessible you are, I know that you are, especially from what we hear from our ambassadors. It, it, it's a, certainly, it's an expectation uh, at Wake Forest. I mean, it, it, Wake Forest is just, a, a, it's the most student-centric university I, I've been to. And so what, we have something called the uh, teacher-scholar model, is what we follow in the School of Business. And uh, it speaks to the emphasis we place on teaching. Um, you have to be a scholar to be uh, in a position where, that Jennifer is in, for example, on a tenure track uh, faculty position in the School of Business, but that we have a real strong emphasis on, on uh, teaching, high quality teaching and ensuring the success of our students while being challenging. Um, and, you know, I think the other the other part of that is it goes a little bit beyond access to faculty, but there there are a lot of resources that are um, there for you to help ensure your success. So by that I mean we have we have dedicated staff whose job it is to serve students. You know, if you're in a bind with a you're having trouble with time management. There's somebody you can go to to help you develop a time management, you know, a schedule that will put you on the road to success. And so, uh, it's, so it's not just faculty, it's actually access to staff like Susie and others 
everybody is student centric at Wake Forest in the School of Business. So, but to go back to your original question, uh, I think all three faculty would say we're incredibly uh, accessible, but you don't necessarily believe us. Ask a, ask a current student, but you, that's the answer you're going to get. I see, I see it all the time in the student comments, uh, how accessible our faculty are. Yeah, it seems far away now, but just background is, as you may recognize, kind of the living room at Pearl Hall and we're all in one building. And so you oftentimes you'll see faculty and I see students stopping faculty. And I know from my experience, students tell me when they reach out to fellow faculty of mine about questions, stuff that they're very responsive. I would give Wake, I'm also involved in some other schools and I would give Wake high marks on that metric. I'll also say it doesn't stop when you graduate. So for me, here's my measure of success as a faculty member. You're out there in the real world and you're trying to apply some optimization model I taught you two years ago and you get stumped. You make me happy by calling me or maybe you don't even get stumped. You shoot me an email and say, hey, I just want to let you know uh, that uh, I use something from your class. That is... Uh, the greatest uh, accomplishment as far as I, you know, take, you know, that the thing that means the most to me as a faculty member is when you get out there, you're actually doing stuff that you learned in the program. And so, uh, you know, maybe a half a year ago, well, we're living in dog years now. It was probably a year or two years ago. Um, but, uh, you know, a student emailed me, she's working with Deloitte. She said, I just want to let you know, I, I use, I teach something called data envelopment analysis in my optimization class. She said, I just applied this with a client. I, in fact, I used the visual basic code we developed in class, like great, you know? So, uh, you know, that to me, that's the real mark of success. And so I guess that's a long winded way of saying we're accessible. We're even accessible after you graduate. In fact, we love hearing from alumni. Um, and we'll in fact ask you to come back and contribute to, and I'm not talking about money, although we'll probably ask you to do that too, but uh, come back and speak to students, you know, come back and uh, help mentor students, link into them as they prepare, students who come behind you, link into them, that sort of thing, and help them with their job search. So, anyway. Yeah, my best lead for projects in the practicum are alumni, and I also teach the practicum in the online MSBA program, and I have graduates come back from both programs to talk about their experience in the um, as data analytics professional. Yes, if any of you have ever been to our, our student alumni panels, those alumni are very active and, and want to share their experiences. So um, we can we we pick their brains from all directions. That's for sure. Um, so we talked a little bit about teams and practicum practicums. Um, Curious, teamwork seems to come up a lot in the MSBA program. And so if you guys could talk a little bit about how the teamwork of this in this program prepares you for the workplace, uh, for the marketplace, I should say, that would be great. I'll take a first crack at that. I think um, I mentioned the conference that uh, was hosted by the center last week or week, back to dog years. I'm like, it was, it's not too long ago. Uh, you know, and one thing that... I think we like to say analytics is a team sport. You know, usually you've got folks who understand the business, you got folks who understand the analytics and almost all the presentations, the keynotes, as well as the panel, they're talking about work they did with their colleagues and engaging people from other units or And so it's by necessity, I believe data analytics is such a crucial part of any organization that you can't, you know, you're not, you're not a, a bench scientist sitting in a lab somewhere mixing chemicals. You got to interact with people work with people. And if you don't, you can end up with a less impactful project because the analytics might be great, but if you haven't thought about how to deploy it to the client the situation, that's going to be a problem. So we try to make sure that Jeff already mentioned, as did Jennifer, that a lot of the, in addition to the practicum, a lot of the project you do in different courses is very much project-based with teams. I'll just say that, that, you know, it's funny because I think, you know, I, I see four of you with your cameras on. Do you guys generally like group work? Yes. All right, great. 
Um, because I was more like Nikki, you know, there's always this, I don't know, like if you could just let me drive my own boat, that'd be great. But you know what doesn't exist? Jobs like that. Um, and so, you know, just, just to echo Shannon, it is what prepares you. There, there is no decent business school curriculum that does not have a lot of group work. And, and that's why, because you always are in a team. You are always dealing with colleagues. You're always building on one another's skills. Um, and so I think that this, this, this program embraces that. Um, and what Shannon does is amazing with the practicum, but even in your other courses, um, you know, I always do a mix of individual to make sure that you personally have developed the skills you want and that I'm assessing you on your individual skills, but that there's still group work because you can, you can do more um, when group work is really um, in its stride and your group is performing well, you will be surprised at what you can do as a group. Um, and so I think that is what most of my colleagues um, probably have a mix up in their course. Yeah, I was on a, I was on a call this morning. It was mostly industry people, uh, a couple of academics talking about data science versus analytics. And one person from industry was talking about their, what they need, the, what they, the, the characteristics of people they want to hire. And this person ran through some technical skills and, and then the way he said it, I kind of laughed. He said, and they need to know how to behave. <laughs> and what he meant by that, he elaborated after that, but it was all the stuff we're talking about, working in teams. How do you work and be professional with someone you might not necessarily even like, but you're on the team with them? Or how do you overcome? You're on a team with somebody and they owe you data and it's not there yet. How do you handle that? How do you overcome those obstacles, right? And uh, as, as Shannon can tell you, since he's dealing with the teams, all that stuff is real uh, in our practicum. But the good news is it's in a safe place. You're not going to lose your job. You might drop a letter grade <laughs> because you're not doing the right thing. But but that's where you want to experience some of these team issues and overcoming obstacles. And um, yeah, every everybody's looking. You know, they, in, in fact, in that same meeting, in same meeting, someone used the term. We're all looking for unicorns, and what they meant by that was people with strong or you know, hiring people with strong people skills and strong technical skills. And um, that's what our, our program is designed to be technical and have the business domain knowledge and the people skills. But you do have to make trade-offs. So we don't go, you know, we're not a, we're not a math department. We're not theorem proof, but you know the methodology when you leave, but you also have these other skills and, uh, so it's, it's a, that blend. The other thing that's kind of interesting in that discussion is, you know, people talk about um, a lot of data science might be automated by AI, but what's not automated, which is what I think we're trying to teach, is identifying a problem, specifying the scope of the problem, creatively trying to find a solution. So those kind of things are not easily automated. And so uh, that blend of technical and we call them essential skills rather than soft skills, essential skills. To me, that's long term job security. That's what companies are looking for, that value added. Some of that's the hardest stuff. Defining the problem is often the hardest thing. Solving it can be relatively easy sometimes. Defining the problem is a challenge. Yeah, I mean, the employers, the employees I talk to, I hear a common refrain. Now, they want to hire folks that are going to fit in their culture that have those essential skills because their belief is we can teach them the tools. We can teach them technologies if they don't have them when they come in. But it's hard to teach someone the right cultural fit to that organization or the essential skills that they look for, be it communication skills or problem framing skills, et cetera. Yeah, I have, to, I have to give you a little anecdote from that same meeting this morning. Again, I, I almost burst out laughing. Luckily, it was Zoom and I had my microphone off. But within the matter of a couple of minutes, one company A, the person said exactly what Shannon just said. You know, uh, uh, it's hard to get somebody into your culture, but, you know, we can teach them. The, essentially, he was saying you can, we can teach them the software. That's not the issue. And like three minutes later, someone said the exact opposite. <laughs> they said, they said, well, if you teach them the technical skills, I can teach them essentially the business is what they said. And so, uh, but
but I, I tend to everything, not everything, but the majority of the people I talk to uh, really do uh, would say that it's a more challenging to teach the essential skills than it is to teach the technical skills. And we're trying to teach that blend. I mean, that's, it's a challenge for us as faculty, but that you have to dedicate credit hours. That's the bottom line. That's what I said in this meeting this morning. If you're serious about it, you have to dedicate credit hours to it. That's what we're doing at Wake Forest. Yeah, something we common we often say. Uh, I heard Jeff say it. I, um, we want our graduates to be problem centric, not data centric. Too often in the practicum, a team will say, "Look at this great model," and we'll be like, "But does it answer the question the client has?" Maybe not. So you know, we, we got to figure out how, how because a successful model is not a successful project. A successful solution or answer to the client's question is what is the where the value is added and the impact is made. Wonderful. Well said. Um, so that's kind of the end of the list of our frequently asked yeah. questions that I wanted to get in front of all of you guys. Um, now I just want to just echo anybody who has questions, feel free to take yourself off mute and ask any questions. Uh, take advantage of this resource here. I'll go ahead. Um, I know you kind of touched a little bit on this with the uh, data boot camp, but kind of a question of mine um, is what can we do from now to when classes begin to kind of prepare for the program, whether that's, you know, like you said, the essential skills or the technical skills, um, what can we do from now to then? Play a lot of golf because you won't have time. I see a lot of golf in your background. You won't have time once July starts. So play your golf <laughs> between now and July. Yeah, I would. I would say uh, the, the, the answer is a little bit dependent on your background, but for the, I'd say that for the mo most students, it would be brush up on whatever statistics course you had, kind of review that, brush up on that. And then uh, if you haven't coded before, you, there's a ton of stuff out there that's free that will kind of burn you in at a very basic level. Uh, when, I guess when you get your Wake Forest email address, um, I forget when that happens, Susie, but at some point be long before they get here, they get their Wake Forest email address and that lets you log in. And we, it, it used to be called Linda, but now it's called LinkedIn Learning. And you can go to LinkedIn Learning and uh, if you just like uh, search on R, for example, I'm guarantee you can find like the most basic R class. And just, you know, if you haven't coded before, go through that. On the other hand, if you're, if you've coded, you know, you might want to, um, you know, uh, jump in at a, a, a higher level uh, or focus on the stats. If you're comfortable coding, you can focus on the stats, but those are probably the two things you can do, the stats and the coding to kind of get you ready for summer because summer is a compressed term. It's a full, there are two, two, three credit courses and one, one credit course, career management is the one credit um, and it's it's compressed down to about six and a half weeks. So it's pretty intense. You'll go to, you'll have class five days a week uh, in the summer. And so anything you can do to just sort of give yourself a little edge, um, uh, that's what I would recommend. Great, thank you so much. You're welcome. Jeff, do you that think it would be useful for so I was going to ask, you know, um, I don't think it's necessary for you to do any SQL in advance because, you know, I kind of started at ground zero with, with SQL. So I would use your time other places than that. Um, but I did happen to think uh, Excel literacy. Is that a good idea for them to do? Because I do not start. I assume you know something about spreadsheets. Yeah. Thanks, Jennifer. That that's a good catch. If you for a long time, I just assumed everybody knew Excel. And um, I actually, to go back to that meeting today, I hate to keep piping on that meeting, but I learned something today. Someone in the, the academic, someone on the academic side said today, we're seeing more and more students who don't know Excel. And they said it's because they, they go to Google. They're always in uh, Google Sheets. And that has nowhere near the functionality that we use in Excel. And I never thought about that before, but apparently that's a thing. And so uh, thank you, Jennifer. If you've, if you've not spent much time in Excel, 
like if you were a math major you or computer science or biology or whatever, you might not have used Excel much at all. Um, that's, you know, assuming you have access to it, that would be a good thing to hone in on. But we do have um, a course in the fall called Business Modeling, which is designed to ratchet up your skill set in Excel. Because the reality is you, you often hear analytics and data science folks, you know, uh, bad mouth, oh, you're just using Excel. But when you get in the real world, guess what? Everybody's using Excel. It doesn't matter. You might be a data scientist at Amazon. I guarantee you, you're still spending a lot of time in Excel. It's just the it's the tool of business. And uh, I never really thought about it, but Google Sheets is different than Excel. I mean, I have thought about it because I hate Google Sheets, but that's that's a different story. We don't have time for it. <laughs> Great question. Any other questions that we can get answered for you guys today? Okay. With that, I will just ask if our professors have any uh, final thoughts to share with you and then we can uh, wrap up. Yeah, I'll just say we're delighted that uh, you're here tonight. We hope to see you in July and I'll put my email in the chat and um, if you have questions, you can uh, reach out to me. I'll echo that. I put my email address in there as you have questions, as you went through the decision-making process um, and you have a question, feel free to reach out to me. Um, uh, identify yourself, where you're coming from, where we met, just so I'll have the context for it. Context for it. And, uh, you know, good luck with your decision. And I look forward to seeing you in the summer um, if you come. I just echo all of that. I'm excited everybody's here. Um, and you know, if I can be of, of use, you have my email address as well. Wonderful. Thank you all for your time, professors. Thank you so much for your time, for joining us, giving us your insight. We really appreciate it. And uh, to everyone else, please feel free to reach out if we can help you with anything along the way. Have a good night. Thanks everybody. Stay safe. <laughs>